We are right now trying to figure out a very bizarre problem is that AI is pushing these slides forward without me touching anything. <laughs> so um, I'm going to try to work with this approximately and, and hope that sometimes what I say and what you see is going to match. So I'm Matthias Keller, I'm the chief scientist at Kayak and um, today I'm here with the purpose of this talk to, to share learnings from our journey of adding machine learning and AI to a let's call it non-AI product. So this might be a little bit different if you're just starting a company today and, um, and you're basically an AI startup, you will still probably hit the same roadblocks that we are going to, to talk about today and, and learn some of these lessons. But really like the major focus is for existing retailers, online, digital, e-commerce, and, and making their products better. So Kayak, I'm sure many of you here know it is um, we are world's leading travel search engine. We process about two billion, more than two billion actually, queries a year. And users come to our site to compare flights, hotels, and cars. And there is a lot of value in comparing because you may save by just booking the same room on a different site or by booking that same flight, maybe not direct, but somewhere else. But we don't only want you um, to just, and I think we give out on the slides, um, we don't only want you just to um, save by comparing. There's also a lot our products can do if these products are actually smart. And what we mean by smart is something like, let's say you want to go to Los Angeles and you might want to know that you could just fly to Burbank and, and save a lot of time spending in traffic. Or you want to visit some family and, and you, you basically start searching for Friday and you do all the comparison, but Friday is extremely expensive and how about the product would tell you that you should rather go on Thursday? Or you want to go in a hotel and, and you want to have, you're really interested in a certain aspect, like how does a gym look like? And how about the product can just serve up the gym pictures for you right away without going through all the hundred images we may have on that hotel? So that's what we, what we think with, with Smart. And um, we also don't want you to only use our product on on a web browser or on a phone, we want you to use our product on any platform where you want to use it. So we have integrations with, with Amazon Alexa, we have integrations on the Google Assistant, we integrate it with Slack. It's, def it's of course also on the mobile apps. And all these platforms just are there to help you on the different stages of traveling. Like traveling is not just that you come to Kayak and you book something. Traveling also means that you manage your travel on Kayak, meaning that we help you organize all the different bookings you do on different sites in one itinerary. And we help you to always let you know when there is like something on the way, like there's a delay on your flight, uh, you, may, you maybe have to rebook something. And, and that's all what our products are trying to do. Um, when you use our products, th there always has been machine learning as a fundamental part because we always had the problem that we are getting the data from all these hundreds of sites out there and we merged that into one view where you can make all your decisions. And that data never arrived particularly pretty or clean. So we always had machine learning and let's for one second try to look at this slide. <laughs> uh, some examples when, we, when, we, when you just run a hotel search, you are, wow, no chance. You're already experiencing machine learning in, by the way, can, can we change over to the PowerPoint deck maybe? Sorry, in the back. I, I think we can move over to PowerPoint. There's like one or two typos and maybe the font wrong, but Maybe we get the slide. <laughs> Sorry for that. Too, too much looking for prettiness. Um, when you use our product, you, you are um, interacting with a lot of machine learning algorithms already today. So for instance, when, you, when you're searching for a city, the cities that you get there are ranked based on, for instance, the popularity of the cities. Like if you type P, there is the first might be Paris and, uh, and not another less popular city with a P. Um, when you look at our hotel page, the image that shows there on every hotel, it's just not a random image. It's, it's an algorithm that says like, we wanna show bedrooms, or it's an algorithm that says like, we wanna show exteriors. When you look at the hotels and, and it says like, there's a, there's a score of, of like 9.5. Um, this is a score that is generated from analyzing thousands of user reviews of actual travelers that have been at that particular hotel. And the sorting of the hotel by itself is a machine learning problem because if you, are, um, if you are searching for hotels, we can't just sort it by price because you either start with hostels or, or some precedent suites. 
We also can just sort it by reviews because that may not be what you want. So we, we have to have a personalized sort algorithm that, um, it's not doing anything. We have to have a personalized sort algorithm that surfaces you a good mixture of, of different hotels that you may want to use. And overall, there are many more problems that we have in our, what we call travel AI stack that we are applying to Kayak to make our product smarter. So we start with uh, having a lot of data. Um, it's a lot of static data, like we know about places, we know about hotels, we know about so many different things. We have all the life prices, the availability. And then we have regression problems, like we wanna show you the right hotel, we wanna, we wanna sort them. We have neural language problems. We wanna analyze the reviews, we wanna summarize them. We wanna extract what's interesting about all these reviews. And also we have uh, image processing problems, like we wanna find the pretty images that are showing the right things of the hotel, like we wanna have the best image, we wanna, we wanna filter out, let's say, blurry images, or we wanna filter out images with, let's say, people on it. Um, and we also wanna know what's on these images, because that's allow us to, for you to search like, I wanna see the, the bedrooms, or I wanna see the gym. And overall, that whole platform then later allows us to, and maybe we can go one slide back, um, and that whole platform then allows us also to build what we call AI applications, which is like our voice assistants, uh, our chatbots, and overall that we still have that idea of like a personal travel assistant that is ubiquitous and, and fitting all your needs. So if we go to the next slide, um, how do companies like us, like ours, how do we get there? Usually, so it's a process of many years, and, and the orange line is where I would say we are, but for a majority, if you want to AI to your company, you always start with collecting data. And in that particular perspective, there has been the buzzword a few years ago called big data. And basically it means like you're collecting unstructured data, like log files. Um, like unstructured data, basically, it's not just like one transaction, $50, it is it's a lot of context. Like a user, cl somebody clicked on something, somebody moved from this side to that page, and just a lot of terabytes of data. And in, initially, like, you can use that data right away out of the gate for reporting and ad hoc analysis. And you will find interesting things. Like you will find out who is more interested in three-star hotels, who is more interested in five-star hotels. And there can be a lot of insight that you can pull out of that data. And, and at some point, you realize that in that data, you could really make decisions automatically. And that's when you start adding machine learning. And at the very beginning, that's like usually, I, I call it like a simple model, like probably not the neural net ideally. And it, it's like a one-off, like maybe maybe a great intern project or, or another effort where you really have this one problem and it, it, it adds immediately to your business, you, you start doing it, and, but you may have it on the side then for a while and not touch it anymore. And this at some point breaks if you scale and if you wanna have more um, complex features when you really have to, to run what I call here machine learning pipelines. Like you need, really need to have a process how you regularly start to collect the data, clean it up, train your model, run different variants of the model, send your model to production, measure it in production, have a constant feedback in there. You may also be in your company that like, there are suddenly hundreds of data scientists and they all need some sort of like the same features, like how do I calculate the lifetime value of a, of a visitor? And you put that in what I call here feature databases so that everyone uses the same features and the same kind of like baseline numbers. And, and you may end up with model registries, like you have a product organization who really knows like, um, if I want to predict if this person is more interested in a hotel room or in an apartment, there is a model over here that I can use. And overall in that process, machine learning and AI is, is going to be a core part of, of the DNA of a company. So like basically whenever you're doing product development, there, there's going to be a, a machine learning or AI component to it. And not like for the sake of having it, but because like what we can do right now, we are not going to develop these products far further by, by just doing design changes. We really have to add new features, and many of these features right now require these skills. So if we go one slide ahead, um, and I wanna go through, through five major lessons learned through our decade long or even longer process of, of getting better in machine learning and AI. And the first thing is that it's almost like a could call it also misconception. Um, one has to make clear that, that machine, learning, machine learning and AI are not a wonder weapon. So we, we see amazing things out there. We see deep fakes. We see all these videos where like 
voice gets totally dubbed, video gets totally changed, and, and, it, and it really feels like that, that AI can do everything and at some point it's maybe taken over the world. But if we look at more business applications, um, what we see is like if, let's say if we would buy a, a storage or an email service, we would usually look like for the four, five, six, nines, which means like 99.9099 and so on availability. And if we look at machine learning and AI, we are far away from that range. So like if, if we look at image classification, which is a super well-studied problem, and it's, it's based on millions of images that these researchers use, I would say we are right now at something like 98% accuracy of kind of like detecting a, a dog versus a cat and so on. And if we go away from, from image processing, this can go down massively immediately. And at some point, we are at the kind of like cutoff, which is 50%, which is like rolling a dice. Um, so there are some problems that cater extremely well to, to especially neural nets, and, and this is everything with images. And I also have an example from Kayak here, which is our classification of hotel images, of tagging them if something is a bedroom or a beach or a bathroom and so on. We have many more of these tags. And also there, like, sometimes it, it will go wrong. So 95% accuracy will mean that 50 of 1,000 predictions are still wrong. And, and for many problems, like for many non-image problems, getting 80% accuracy is already really, really hard. And, and that would mean that 200 out of 1,000 predictions are wrong. And, and one thing also to keep in mind, and, and there are some outliers, like we have seen the, the Go Blaying machine from the Google Brain team that was really, as I said, like blaying moves that nobody has ever seen before. But at the end of the day for the AI we talk about, it is really about algorithms learning from already existing data. So they're not going to generate any new solutions. They basically can give the best answer of something they have seen before in the training data set. Lesson number two, and it uh, would be nice to get the next slide. Um, what's interesting in, in, in machine learning is that an AI is like there has been an amazing amount of progress. And if you would start now to download TensorFlow and to train your first neural net, and I think one of their examples is this handwriting data set over here, you were probably done by the end of, of my talk. So it, it, but it seems extremely simple to, to, to train a neural net. So sounds like easy, right? Like just do that with my own problem and I'm done. The reality here is like one has to, to really know that if we're applying this to an actual problem that, that is in our business, it's gonna take weeks or months and it may not even work out. And, and there are many reasons for that. Um, we may have a problem that is just not within the wheelhouse of, of machine learning algorithms. Um, we may have a lot of issues collecting our data together. Um, data is very often the problem because also if we think about it, like these, these image classifiers, they were trained like on hundreds of millions of images and we just may not have so much data. So careful here, like it's doing machine learning and AI is, is a serious undertaking. The next lesson which uh, fits to that is specifically talking about data. So realizing that machine learning is, is definitely a data play. The more data you have, the, the better your algorithms perform. It seems very natural to say like, well, I have this 10 years of data, so let's just use that data because it gives me a massive head start. But what we saw is that we really very often went more into trying to pipe fit this data instead of making real progress. And as much as it's allowed to look into historic data, one has to be very careful of that data because it has been recorded many, many years ago. Um, maybe not everyone involved in the recording is kind of like still available. Um, there, there have all, been all kinds of bugs during the time. There's different levels of what this data can offer because like additional data points, like it has been augmented over time. And there, there are many, many tricky things in that data. And, and most likely what we realize is that our algorithm right now would do so much better if there was one more thing, if we would have that, that would be the perfect feature. And in, instead of trying to, to kind of like get that feature through all kind of proxies and mangling the data and trying to somehow find it and trying to somehow estimate it, we, we think or we learned that it's the, the right route to just start data collection from scratch, try to get the data there and, and get the data the right way we need it for our algorithm. Moving on one more. Um, what's also very interesting, we, um, I'm coming a lot from, uh, my background is, is the foundation is in software engineering and I, and I think we all have a great understanding how agile software development works, 
we do these sprints, they, they go two weeks, we have a review, we, we have tasks, we, we give these points, like we have good estimates, how long is going to take a senior developer to do this or that, and how many points do I have? And this doesn't really work like that in, in machine learning and AI projects. Um, there is still a, a research component to it, and there has to be a research component to it. And the risk here now is that um, one, gets, one can get sidetracked pretty fast. Um, I, I'm showing here the, the cloud gate in Chicago as an example for we often say like uh, the risk of chasing the shiny object. Um, one has to be really careful in should I really go with a neural net? Everyone who kind of like is new to the, to the, to the scene kind of like likes working with these neural nets because there's a lot of appeal, but they may not be the right thing for the business. And uh, when you start looking into data, there are so many things that are going sideways or wrong or, or are really interesting that you can really lose sight of what you're trying to achieve very easily. And as much as we cannot run machine learning and AI projects with, with like story points, it is it's really very, very important to have regular, let's say it's also like a two week checkpoint of really looking at where we at, how much better did we get in the last two weeks? Is there any chance that we are going to get significantly better in the next two, four, six weeks? Should we continue with the project? Should we kind of like stop doing it? Is it ready for production? And now coming to lesson number five, and this is the, the final learning for today. Um, one also has to understand, and this is like when I showed the different maturity levels of, of companies doing AI, it, it's really a, a cycle and it's, it's, it's a process that one has to really be fully engaged with. Um, if we train a model today, we train it on the data we have seen basically until yesterday, and tomorrow's data might be very different. There can be new, completely new data points showing up. Let's say in the kayak case, there may be a new airport, or there may be a, a new type of hotel, or there new kind of a new language, or like there are so many things that change, and as much as we can try running our existing machine learning model with a belief that everything is still going to be fine, <laughs> the better route is to continuously measure and, and retrain when needed. And, and this is in a little flywheel over here, so one really has to, to get into the cycle of uh, training, putting it in production, measuring against some sort of ground truth, so maybe the, the old model from yesterday, and then keeping to retrain because because otherwise like we made this we made this this the uh, we made this presentation to like our manager what great success we had when we initially deployed uh, that model but all that fame is going to disappear soon if we don't keep um, staying at the model and keep improving it concluding and this is one more slide away um, I cannot change but what I finally want to say is that um, it is definitely exciting what we can now built with AI and machine learning tools being available. Um, I, I really think that our products are going to significantly change over time. Um, we, will, we will see completely new products and at some point basically everything, there's not just like a, a little bit of machine learning in our products, there, there will be everything in there will be, um, will be machine learning and, and we need a lot of talent for that and, and we also need to have a lot of work on the culture of our companies and really bridging this gap between software engineering, which is still needed, and, and machine learning and AI, and, and have these groups work together and, and build these new uh, magical products. So um, thank you for listening. Um, sorry for the slides, and thank you. You can stay, Matthias. I believe there's um, two more people. Um, if you could please come up, Sheila Anderson. We're gonna, we can just jump into the next session. Oh wait, questions. Right. Sorry, sorry. Do you want to take questions for? I can take questions. Yeah, right. we have time. Does anyone have questions? Yeah, please. And, and one reason where we don't want to use, and, and the data flow to a vendor is already one part. The ownership of the data, the consent to share the data is, is already one part where we, where we are very careful and where we prefer the in-house solutions.
models. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a mixture of everything. We are, we are in a hybrid cloud um, with our own infrastructure, but also, for instance, like if you need a lot of GPUs, we don't own them right now ourselves, so we get them from a cloud, but for a lot of other things, we, we use our own infrastructure. So you know the, the the good news is that a, a lot of the things we train on they don't evolve they don't involve a lot of individual user information like you know we're not classifying social security numbers so to speak so the good news here is that that a lot of the data like let's say hotel information and things like that it is still proprietary but uh, it is it's not as much of a privacy issue then still all right one more maybe yeah. And you, the eighty percent is so first of all we, we measure models in many different ways like let's say if I do a price prediction I want to know what's the range that the, what's the average error for instance so like that would be a totally different metric um, if we are like classifying text extraction that's more like how often do I see it you know I, I think overall it's always a trade-off what's the what's the cost of a false positive to you what's the cost of a false negative to you how do you balance it out between optimizing for finding anything at all versus finding the right thing. And um, I don't think that we have a, that there's a specific problem of not like finding the right model or, uh, or, or having, of course, noise on the data is always there. I, I think it is just like, let's say, if, if you look at regression problems, there is just neural nets are maybe not the best choice for it. And, uh, and there are other great algorithms, but it really depends what you do. Like if I say, we, we try some really interesting things like a lot of image work and, and there is, you know, I, I think, yeah, I, I think some things are just hard. Let's put it like that. Time for one more question if anyone has a question. We're good? Awesome. There's one in the back. It's right there. Yeah, that's that's the tricky part, right? Because it is um, you you can really line up the the development resource, but you may wait forever for the model. And I think that's where I where I see a lot of value in these in these regular checkpoints where we are saying like, okay, today we are at the let's say accuracy of so and so many dollars, and is that good enough for a product? And and how long is it? How long will it take us to shave off another ten dollars? And and is that worth the wait? So I I, I think it is kind of like. Yeah, re really regular checkpointing and really hoping to, I, I think that the key is like that you give up on projects when you have to and that you keep going when you can. Yeah, that, that's, that's one good example how, how we evaluate if, if, if a model is worthwhile our time. Thank you, Matthias. Thank you.